All right. Thank you, Robert. I really appreciate it. As Robert said, my name is Paul Helfrich. I'm a student here in the Department of Biology. Um, I won't waste too much time on who I am, but I'm very excited to tell you all about uh, my main interest, which is T. Brio. We'll go into that a little more in just a few minutes. Um, this is a, what I would say is a fairly obscure topic. We're going to be talking about mixozoan fish parasites today. Uh, if you don't know what they are, that is totally fine. You are going to learn a lot about them, and I'm very excited about that. I think this is going to be a great opportunity for a lot of you to learn more about a variety of topics related to biology and restoration. So when we're telling the story of T. Brio, there are really three organisms that we're going to focus on today. This is a fairly complex uh, life cycle. So I'm going to try and tell the story of this organism as concisely as possible. We're going to first talk about bryozoans. Then we're going to be talking about T. bryo, also known as tetracapsuloidae, bryo salmonae, and then salmonid fish. All three of these organisms play an important role in uh, today's talk. So our first, uh, the first organism that we're going to talk about are bryozoans. Bryozoans are a phylum of aquatic invertebrates. They're sessile organisms, which means that they primarily attach themselves to the underside of rocks and floating vegetation, as well as vegetation that is suspended in the water column. They're very interesting organisms before uh, before I got involved in the research project that really sparked my interest in, um, in this organism, I really had no idea that they even existed. They are something truly out of time. They're a very ancient organism and uh, are actually fairly famous because of, their, because of the way that they show up in the uh, fossil record, but they are very much uh, an important part of many freshwater and marine ecosystems around the world. They're colonial organisms, which is also, which I think is also quite interesting. Uh, they produce, or excuse me, they reproduce via hermaphroditic reproduction, which means that each colony has both male and female uh, Parts. It allows them to um, produce both sexually with other colonies of genetically similar individuals and asexually through the production of what are called statoblasts. Statoblasts are essentially tiny capsules of genetic information that uh, can be released into the environment and give rise to new colonial structures. Does that make sense to anybody? What or to everybody what colonial means. These are colonies of genetically similar organisms physically attached to one another, each serving its own purpose, uh, whether, that be, um, whether that be reproduction or feeding or structure. Each zooid, each animal, serves its own function within the colony. Now what you're seeing right here is actually the lophophores of these uh, zooids. So in order to feed, these colonies extend these structures out into the water. They always kind of remind me of fans. And they are able to trap floating organic particles that drift through carried by the current. Um, this is a pretty, uh, I've seen this function before in other animals. I've seen, for instance, porcelain crabs feeding like this, but um, when you see pictures of bryozoan colonies fully extending their lophophores, it looks quite alien. I think they're very cool. Um, additionally, if you are looking for these, they are most likely going to be found away from light. They compete with algae for uh, their for space, basically. And when algae or sediment settles on them, that can decrease the ability of their lophophores to function. 
which of course uh, kills the colony. So these guys are going to be found usually in the dark, sometimes in the undercut of banks, away from uh, algae and away from sediment, but still in a place where the uh, flow of the river can bring organic particles into their loaf of force. This is a bryozoan colony. This is actually a picture of a bryozoan colony that was taken on the East Coast. Uh, there are several different um, species, obviously. And uh, specifically in Delaware, this species, which forms this massive um, uh, colonial structure, floats through the river system um, when it is not attached to the bank or to vegetation. Thought that was a very cool picture. Uh, here's a, kind of the other end of the extreme. This is more the kind that you would see in uh, Montana. Um, I, as I said, I think this looks quite alien. These are the lophophore structures. The lophophores are actually this kind of crown of ciliated tentacles that you see around the, around the organism while the internal structures are of course, located at the base of the loaf of fours. The next organism that we're going to be talking about are salmonid fish. Now, this is, I'm sure, something that you all are generally more familiar with than bryozoans. I know that I definitely was. Salmonid fish are all in the ray finned fish. They're in, uh, I believe, Actinopterygii. They have slender bodies, rounded scales, and these forked tails. Almost all of them are predators. They're generally predators of aquatic insects. Um, and some of them are andromedous, which means that they uh, migrate to fresh and salt water in order to reproduce. Obviously, that's not all species, but that's one of the uh, things that you see in salmonid fish. Additionally, all of these are high, or many of these are high value sport fish especially in cold water ecosystems uh, that Montana holds, obviously very precious. Um, so let's talk about the Salmonids of Montana. Obviously we have our natives. We have two cutthroat species, the bull trout, the grayling, the red banded trout, three species of whitefish. Obviously uh, all of these, I believe, except for the whitefish are generally considered uh, high value sport fish. Of course, the bull trout and the grayling have been subject to um, intense uh, restoration efforts in order to bring them back into many of the ecosystems in Montana. Additionally, we have non natives like the rainbow trout, uh, the brown trout, the brook trout, a couple different types of smelt, and two salmon. All of these fall into the salmonids. So let's talk a little bit about parasitism. Now that we've talked about our two hosts, uh, let's move on to T. Brio itself. So parasitism, I thought this was a very good way to describe it, is predation in units of less than one. I think that really sums it up very well. Although parasites are, um, I think a lot of parasites go unnoticed by people and sort of understudied because of a variety of reasons. They are among the most plentiful and diverse organisms on the planet. The uh, genetic diversity within things like helminths um, is absolutely incredible. Now, one kind of blurred line that I think a lot of people really uh, become confused by is the line between parasitism and disease. Although some parasites um, can introduce diseases into their host organisms or are seen as uh, really a pest for many of our organisms like our cattle or you know human parasites we see as sort of this disgusting thing that should never occur. Uh, really, in the animal world, parasitism ex is extremely common. And uh, in most wild populations, you see all sorts of parasites in most organisms. So don't think that just because an organism uh, like our salmonids or like our bryozoans are affected by parasites, don't think of that as something that um, is uh, out, you know, uncommon. Additionally, um, 
most of the parasites that we're familiar with are generally, we're generally familiar with them because they are, they are uh, maladapted to the host that they um, parasitize. Usually, it's, or, it's almost always advantageous to keep hosts alive. The parasites use hosts for a variety of different functions. So anytime that we hear about parasites, you know, infecting an organism and causing it to die, that's usually as a result of the parasite not being well adapted or not being highly evolved with that host. Hope that gives everybody a little bit of a baseline knowledge on parasitism before we move on to our organism in question. So we're going to talk about the evolution of parasites. As I just talked about, when parasites are causing disease, that's because they're not highly evolved with their host. So we're going to be talking about evolution in the terms of change of frequency of alleles in a population. Generally, the creation of structures is energetically expensive and structures that serve no purpose will be lost. That's one of the uh, things that I'm sure many of you learned in, ev in evolution here. Um, so parasites rely on other organisms to fulfill usually their energetic needs. So a lot of the parasites that you see in the, wor in the, in the wild are sort of these reduced organisms that have gradually lost uh, many of their structures as they have become more and more reliant on their hosts for their life cycle. Um, and T. Brio is no exception. As to sum up what I just said, generally as the evolution, as evolution trends towards obligate parasitism, as organisms become more and more reliant on parasitism to complete their life cycle and serve their energetic needs, structural complexity is going to go down. So, T. Brio and other mixozoans, by this logic, are, were probably cnidarians, uh, or excuse me, are cnidarians, but they were probably more complex cnidarians uh, in the um, evolutionary past. However, as they trended towards obligate parasitism, they lost all of these complex traits. These traits no longer served a purpose in their life cycle, so they became further and further reduced into what we see today. These are mixozoans. Now, if any of you have taken biodiversity or any of the other biology classes, you might remember what the defining structure of cnidarians are. Oh, we're not going to talk about that yet. I must just switch to that. So anyways, um, this loss, loss of complexity results in tiny genomes. You no longer need uh, huge genomes to store the genetic information for lots and lots of structures. This has resulted in some very interesting um, traits in mixozoa. These are mixozoa here. Uh, for instance, there is loss of cell-to-cell -cell communication, which is something that we thought was necessary for multicellular life to exist. Um, in a lot of ways, they uh, have lost any type of motility. Many of, or excuse me, at least this species in particular has no mitochondrial DNA. And as I'm sure that you have seen on the internet, the mitochondria Absolutely, absolutely, is the powerhouse of the cell. So uh, these mixozoans don't have mitochondria, so they are not respirating. They are creating their energy or gaining it, probably gaining it from their host in some other way that we don't even understand at this point. Sure. Yeah, motility is the ability to move. Okay. So a lot, or some cnidarians, um, many of them drift uh, with the current, but some are able to sort of swim against it. You might have seen that in jellyfish. These guys don't have the structures to move. 
So let's talk about the geographic range. Now, after, some, after, the, uh, after fish kills in Montana, there was this big concern that um, T. Brio was a invasive species. A lot of people thought that this was something that had been introduced into Montana rivers accidentally by human drivers. This is probably not the case. Um, there have been intensive genetic studies into T. Brio DNA to determine its origin. And uh, in one of my favorite papers, one of the experts on T. Brio um, says that T. Brio probably originated in North America and was subsequently transported to Europe. Now, this was, this, you know, kind of brings on another question. What brought it to Europe? Was it humans? Was it something else? And uh, actually, the separation in genetic lineage between North American T. Brio and European T. Brio actually predates the human transport of fish. Now, that is somewhat confusing because, it, again, it's unclear how this transport was occurring. There are two main theories on how this might have spread and increased its geographic range. The first is that it may have been spread by uh, freshwater fish going out into um, salt water and becoming lost, and then subsequently transporting this disease to another continent. Now, I'm not an expert in fish, but that is thought to be the weaker of the two. Um, more likely, it was probably brought from North America to Europe uh, through waterfowl migration. There have been several species of mixozoans that have been shown to parasitize waterfowl. Um, additionally, there have been instances in which um, bryozoans survive the passage through waterfowl uh, ingestion. So it seems fairly likely that maybe some statoblasts, that's again the sort of like seed structures of the bryozoans became ingested by um, birds in North America that subsequently um, flew to Europe and uh, passed these statoblasts out, thus completing the colonization of Europe by T. Brio. Of course, this is just conjecture. Um, and we'll probably never know. So, what I was getting to a moment ago, now we can finally talk about mixozoan structures. This is a mixozoan cell that you see in front of you. A lot of people who are unfamiliar with mixozoans might think that they're a bacteria or a virus. They are neither of these things. They're actually eukaryotic, so they store their DNA in, um, in wrapped up uh, centrioles and um, chromosomes inside of a cell nucleus, which of course separates them from bacteria that store their genetic information um, just in those large loops inside the cell. I'm not explaining that super well, but basically this is a multicellular animal. It's not a plant, it's not a bacteria, it's not a virus, it's an animal. It's a strange animal, but an animal nonetheless. Um, it lacks all epithelial structures on the edges. Usually these, uh, the division between the internal and external structures, it really, if there are any, in mixozoans is just a few cells. It's just sort of this very fragile um, container of those two polar capsules that you see up there. Those are the only real internal structures. Um, all, uh, all of them are obligate parasites, like we, like we talked about, and they lack nervous, muscular, or digestive structure. Um, they replicate by endogeny. I actually learned what that is recently. They don't really go through, uh, some might think that they replicate through like binary fission um, or maybe a sexual process, but endogeny actually refers to the fact that this cell is able to produce spores within itself. Um, the centrioles in the cells actually play no part in the reproduction 
and the, um, the reproduction of this organism. So it's something totally separate from binary fission or from uh, um, mitosis or meiosis. Uh, really what defines them is these polar bodies, which I already pointed those out. Now, polar bodies are very similar. They are really one and the same um, with cnidarian nematocysts. I hope that this, if you don't know what a nematocyst is, I hope that this works. So this is actually a jellyfish stinging cell. And that's um, what we're looking at right now. We, uh, we might not be able to watch that again. But basically what you saw is the process of a jellyfish sting. When this hair trigger was uh, activated by, the, um, by a brush with another surface, this tiny biological harpoon was released and it jutted into the other organism that had just rushed it. Um, this is the same thing that mixozoans do, which is the reason why we know that they're related to cnidaria other than genetically. So we can see that again, the hair trigger, the polar body opens and fires into the next organism. Now, this originally confused me. I thought, excuse me, I thought that um, mixozoans just sort of had polar capsules. I thought that they uh, just were like very small jellyfish. They have these nematocysts, they have the polar capsules, those are one and the same. Um, but that's not really the case. They are so reduced by obligate parasitism that it's not that they have polar capsules, it's that they are polar capsules. They are mm -hmm. all that remained of this ancient jellyfish um, ancestor and now just function in this nematocyst polar capsule life cycle. So let's talk about what happens when these tiny stinging cells that we know as mixozoans um, occur in bryozoans. So as we talked about, bryozoans have those lophophores, right? They gather the organic, uh, the organic materials floating through the water, and this leaves them susceptible to these mixozoans. Mixozoans are actually ingested through the lophophores, specifically T. bryo. Now, once inside the bryozoan uh, cavity, the single cell stages attach themselves to the bryozoan body wall and sort of sit dormant for a while. They can persist in this cryptic stage for long periods of time as just a single cell. However, when overt uh, development occurs, just like I talked about earlier with that endogeny, um, these single cells give rise to huge spore sacs, which is what you see right here. These are all T. bryo spores within this larger spore sac. I know that that's a little bit blurry, but what I hope you can really take from that is that just a single cell gave rise to this multidimensional structure that contains thousands of infective cells within it. I'm just going to grab a drink of water real quick. This overt and covert stage uh, can actually cycle within the bryozoan. So just because a single cell stage has given rise to one of these spore sacs, that's not necessarily reflective that that won't happen again from that, from uh, within that organism. So overt and covert can happen at different times of the year. And it's sort of like a switch um, where this covert infection that has no effect on the bryozoan and no effect on the release of spores just suddenly gives rise to thousands of spores.
So next, we'll talk about bryozoan to fish transmission. So the story so far is that the lophophores ingest T. bryo, it attaches itself to the wall, and gives rise to thousands of spores. These spores are released from bryozoan pores, and they uh, attain passage through surrounding vegetation in the same way that I talked about earlier in this passive transport into the water. Then, when these spores come into contact with salmonid fish, they fire their polar filament, that's the same thing as the nematocyst, into the fish. That uh, animation that I showed you earlier where there's that hair trigger occurs and I harpoon the fish, usually into the gills uh, or other weaker structures, but it's usually through the gills. Once they, have become, once they have harpooned the fish and sort of pulled themselves into the gills, they achieve a widespread dispersal through the vascular system. So they enter the blood of the fish and are then subsequently transported throughout the fish as a whole. Then replication within the fish begins. This usually happens in the kidneys, but it can happen in other organs, in other organs but they are able to colonize the kidney of the fish. These single cells differentiate into what's called pseudoplasmodium. These are amoeba-like cells that give rise to spores within the fish. This part of this story is still a little uh, confusing for me. I'm working on understanding it better, but um, basically travel through the vascular system, colonize the kidneys, give rise to spores in the kidneys. Once the spores, um, once there has been all this replication of spores, these spores are passed out of the urine and feces of the fish for bryozoan recolonization. It's worth noting that the spores that are released from fish and bryozoans are actually two separate stages of, um, the, of T. bryo, the mixospore and the actinospore. Now, different fish species are affected very differently. Um, when, there are, when there is replication of the parasite within certain species, such as the mountain whitefish, it can uh, lead to uh, large-scale mortality, especially in the context of um, the disease process. Additionally, certain species cannot produce viable spores. I'm not totally clear why, but I assume that the spores are somewhat malformed and thus cannot um, complete recolonization. This points to the fact that some fish or, uh, yes, that some fish may be dead end or accidental hosts of the parasite. The parasite may not, may be so poorly adapted to parasitizing the fish that it's uh, accidental. They're not attempting to replicate within this, these species of fish, which as we talked about earlier, when there is that maladaption with parasites, that can lead to disease. So what you're probably thinking at this point is, okay, Paul, so you've given us a biology lesson, but why is this actually important? We're, we, all we've talked about is just these sort of strange single-celled organisms that infect rhizomes and fish. Why is it important? It's important to humans because of what is called proliferative kidney disease, also known as PKD. If you are a fisherman or you have been following the news, uh, in 2016 in the Yellowstone River, there was a huge outbreak of proliferative kidney disease that led to uh, the mortality event that you're seeing right here. These are mountain whitefish. As I said, they are uh, very affected by proliferative kidney disease. And this was a huge problem. It led to the shutdown of more than 180 miles of river and um, obviously resulted in thousands of dead fish as well as uh, lots and lots of revenue lost from those areas. So what is PKD? What occurs when fish 
uh, develop it. So the first thing that we're going to see is, of course, where they replicate, a swollen kidney. Additionally, pale gills can occur, anemic blood, hyperplastic organs, we'll talk about what that means in a second, decreased red blood cell count, and increase in leukocytes. These are um, immune cells. So this is particularly dangerous for a couple of reasons. Hyperplastic organs is something that I wasn't familiar with before I began this study. Hyperplastia refers to when um, a disease process occurs that leads to organs um, becoming damaged and becoming uh, thicker in sort of like a tumor-like response to the presence of the parasite. Additionally, as you can imagine, uh, decreased red blood cell count and anemic blood leads to difficulties um, in respiration for the fish, which can cause a whole set of problems on its own. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the fact that many of these trout um, need cold water to live. This is uh, one of the other reasons, and this can be, uh, there can be interaction between, you know, warmer waters, as we'll talk about in a second, and anemic blood and decreased red blood cell count. It's a whole slew of issues. It's not just a one faceted disease process. So let's talk about the pathology within the fish. When PKD develops, a massive immune response um, occurs. This is generally because warmer temperatures, this is very important, if you don't hear anything else in this presentation, this is what you want to listen to. Warmer temperatures lead to increased replication of the parasite within fish. Because there is this increased replication of the parasite, a massive immune response is mounted by the fish's immune system. This causes hyperplastic growth, like we talked about, which is a tumor-like growth within the organs affected by the, fit, affected by the disease. There is a critical osmotic regulation failure, which of course occurs in the kidneys. So the fish go through kidney failure. They are unable to uh, clean their blood and pass out contaminants uh, through their urine. There is a decrease in oxygen transport. That's because the presence of the parasite uh, leads to a decrease in the chemical that um, facilitates the production of new red blood cells and there's a decreased oxygen concentration um, within the blood of the fish. Of course, this spells disaster for many fish. Additionally, if all of that wasn't enough on our poor fish, the role of secondary infections is very important when we talk about PKD. PKD, as I mentioned a minute ago, is generally brought on by, uh, or it's thought to be brought on by environmental conditions, specifically low flows and high temperatures. This leads to increased environmental bacterial growth within the river itself. This increased bacterial growth can lead to more secondary infections within the fish. And because as we talked about, uh, the massive immune response that is mounted by the fish in response to the parasite leaves the fish generally immunocompromised and unable to recover from these secondary infections. Mortality is very, very high in populations that are affected by PKD. First of all, I would like to say that fish kills are thought to be very difficult to quantify even if they are occurring in remote stretches of river or in lakes or, um, or, in, or, in lakes or uh, ponds or whatever, they can go completely undetected by people. It's very difficult to understand their true prevalence because of um, the role that predators take, the decomposition uh, brought on by higher temperatures. It's hard to know their full extent. 
That being said, in laboratory experiments and in fish farms, PKD leads to an 85% reduction in fry density. It uh, disproportionately affects juvenile fish, which of course is very hard on the population as a whole. And additionally, especially in the case of mountain whitefish, this can lead to up to 90% mortality in populations affected by PKD. Now, if you don't know how serious that is, other, um, other diseases you know, can lead, generally lead to very low um, mortality in whole populations, usually below 10%. This can represent a huge impact on wild fish populations. And as we talked about this, this says 12 to 14 degrees, it's generally thought to be a 15 degree threshold, causes disease to occur when salmonids become affected by T. bryo, passed out of bryozoans, and this is gonna be important for our last part of our presentation, when the water temperature is kept below 15 degrees C, infection occurs, you know, the parasite is present within the salmonid, but no clinical symptoms are present. This leaves us lots of questions about environmental conditions. So, just some final thoughts on PKD. The parasite intensity does not necessarily create PKD. Even if organisms are exposed to high levels of the parasite, that doesn't necessarily mean that the disease will develop. Um, additionally, it's very important to note that parasite intensity is not the cause of mortality from what we think. It's mostly the inflammatory response related to the presence of the parasite. Whoops. So, in our final portion of this, and I will try and keep this brief, I appreciate uh, how well y'all have been listening to me. Let's talk about restoration possibilities. Now, this is a emergent disease. So there is not a lot of research on how we address PKD and T. bryo. We could, it has been suggested in the literature, remove one or both of the host species. This has been somewhat successful with other mixozoans, um, especially M. cerebralis, which maybe a few of what you are familiar with, is the, cause, is the causative agent of uh, whirling disease. It's sort of a cousin of T. bryo. Um, so we could remove one or both of the host species. We could remove either the bryozoans or the salmonids from an ecosystem. We could enhance degraded ecosystems. Um, bryozoans are thought to be very related to anthropogenic activity, specifically uh, the presence of sewage treatment as well as um, their, their notoriety for colonizing a variety of structures built by humans in the river. We could try for something uh, along the lines of biocontrol, which is always a slippery slope, but has been effective with other diseases, or we could try and control environmental conditions. So let's talk about the removal of hosts. First of all, in areas um, affected by this, the removal of fish may be ineffective. Um, it's not necessarily viable to remove salmonids from uh, their wild ecosystems. That's going to be very unpopular and may actually be worse than PKD. Um, additionally, the removal of bryozoans from, um, from ecosystems is probably very difficult. Bryozoans can colonize extremely tiny spaces underneath uh, the sides of rocks in um, areas where they're going to be able to grow away from sunlight and therefore uh, avoid detection. Additionally, they can colonize a variety of substrates. So in my opinion, it's not necessarily practical to attempt to remove bryozoans from a, uh, 
from an ecosystem. Additionally, if what we know about the release of spores from M. cerebralis holds true, and it probably does, um, a single Tubifex worm, which is the obligate host of M. cerebralis, can release thousands of infective spores uh, in a very, very short amount of time. So even a single bryozoan might be able to release enough spores to reinfect an entire ecosystem. Um, additionally, there definitely is a prevalence of uh, natural reservoirs. Even if we were able to remove bryozoans or salmonids, the other host would probably serve as the, uh, as it would serve as the infective agent uh, almost immediately. So as soon as we removed the bryozoans and they recolonized an area, spores released from the fish would probably just infect the bryozoans right away. Um, additionally, as we talked about, uh, bryozoans produce these statoblasts, which can lie dormant. They're sort of like the seed stage of this animal. Um, although the jury is still out in the literature, uh, it's thought that statoblasts probably can become infected by T. bryo and therefore lay dormant for long periods of time. So we could completely poison a river and then as soon as the satoblasts that were waiting on the environmental conditions to return gave rise to more bryozoans, they would probably be infected bryozoans. This I don't think is something that we should focus on. I don't think it'll be effective and I don't think it's practical. The enhancement of degraded ecosystems is an interesting thought. As I said with M. cerebralis, the cousin of T. bryo, this actually has been shown to be somewhat effective. Um, as I said, bryozoans, bryozoan growth correlates with uh, eutrophic changes. So when there's more uh, organics in the water, the bryozoan biomass increases so by limiting the amount of eutrophication of rivers, we may be able to control bryozoan growth. Um, additionally, the farming ranching influences on this uh, issue are thought to be fairly prevalent. Um, farming does, of course, draw a lot of water out of the river, uh, especially even during times of low flows, which of course is necessary for um, the growth of plants, but this may be uh, increasing the prevalence of T. bryo just because those warmer temperatures um, correlate with bryozoan growth and T. bryo replication. This has had some success with other mixozoa, specifically M. cerebralis. Um, as I said, M. cerebralis parasitizes tubifex worms by um, enhancing the degraded ecosystems that tubifex worms live in, they have been able to somewhat control uh, M. cerebralis. But more research is definitely needed on this subject. Uh, second to last, we have some biocontrol. Resistant strains of host species may exist. Um, this has been effective with M. cerebralis introducing uh, tubifex worms that are resistant to um, the parasite into ecosystems. However, problems with colonization by these resistant lineages uh, remain. They definitely are present in the ecosystem in a lot of areas and are not contributing to uh, whirling disease as a whole, but the whirling disease problem still exists. Um, additionally, bryozoans are very poorly understood by the larger scientific community. So more research is definitely needed if we are to attack this issue from a biocontrol standpoint. The most interesting for me um, idea is the control of environmental conditions. As we already talked about, organic release probably has uh, some effect on bryozoan growth. But really what I think we should focus on in my humble opinion, is temperature control. <coughs> excuse me. Um, this is, excuse me, I'm gonna cough again. <coughs> Sorry. 
Um, the release of water from upstream dams may effectively cool uh, the river. This is actually uh, Clark Canyon Reservoir in Dillon, Montana. Um, obviously the jury is still out because this hasn't been tried, but this structure holds back Clark Canyon Reservoir. So it's a possibility that releasing water from water retention areas like this may effectively cool the water and therefore you effectively cool the water below the threshold, PKD doesn't develop. Um, in rivers that are not tailwaters, small water retention dams may be uh, warranted, which is what I'm going to talk about with my research a little bit. Uh, just to sum this up, the control of environmental conditions may be the key to preventing PKD. The release of colder water from retention areas is definitely a possibility, but more research is needed uh, regarding fish exposed to these temperatures in wild settings because it's only under laboratory conditions where the 15 degrees um, is really uh, the main contributor to the development of PKD. There may and probably are other environmental conditions that go into the development. Additionally, if we are able to even make some of these half measures, lessened severity of PKD creates resistance in fish populations. So my project, and I know we're running out of time, so I'm gonna try and keep this short, um, really has two goals at its current stage. My project probably will change and add or take away more goals, but this is its current state. First of all, we need to understand the distribution of the parasite within the Big Hole River. This is a necessity for effectively addressing uh, T. Brio, and we also need to uh, really understand its prevalence throughout the year and throughout the spatial distribution in the river. If you're going to address something, you need to know where it is first. The way that uh, I plan and have previously um, effectively measured the distribution of T. Brio is through something called environmental DNA. As many of you know, um, organisms shed their DNA into the surrounding environment uh, just because of things like light, temperature, uh, microbes and enzymes, and time lead to the shedding of outer skin cells usually. I mean, we all leave our hair, our skin cells all over where we, we are. Um, it's the same idea with the parasite. Of course, it's very difficult to find DNA uh, because it's so small. So the way that you can detect DNA within an environmental DNA sample is through something called PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Essentially, what this is, is finding a needle in a haystack. We know that the needle in the haystack exists. That's the strand of T. Brio DNA. We can then locate and replicate the strand of T. Brio DNA until we have an entire haystack of needles. Once we have an entire haystack of needles, then we can really tell that it's there. And using quantitative PCR, we can tell how many needles there are. And therefore, that tells us something about how much DNA is in the sample. If that confused you, we'll go through it here. Basically, T. Brio is present in a sample. Primers bind to only that T. Brio DNA. A polymerase creates strands of specific lengths. That's the copying process. New strands become template strands for the polymerase to work on. And eventually, concentration of the DNA will increase. It's a complicated subject, but I hope that helped you all understand it a little better. Basically, it's a way to detect and quantify the amount of DNA in the environment. Goal number two is to address the risk of PKD. There are several thoughts on how we, how we might do this. The first is definitely to investigate abiotic changes. 
when does water temperature and low flows uh, occur? Riparian replantation may be effective. It may shade the water. However, as I'm sure at least a few of you know, riparian replantation is a hot topic that lots of people are working on um, and is not as easy as it sounds. So this is sort of a long-term goal. Um, there may be warranted in channel changes through uh, the deepening of channels. Um, I am not really familiar with this process, so I'm not going to talk about it too much, but basically by deepening channels, we may be able to create colder water in the river. And finally, water retention. I know that I've brought it up a couple times, and now this is what we're going to talk about. Um, the big question of my research is do small-scale water retention structures effectively cool below the 15 degree threshold margin? I will be investigating the effects of one of these structures on the Big Hole River in order to address this question. Second of all, if that is true, does the 15 degree uh, threshold prohibit the development of PKD in wild populations? I guess we'll just have to see. You'll have to come back for uh, part two of this presentation sometime later. Finally, I'm just going to leave you with uh, one thought by Beth Okamara. She's one of the leading researchers in uh, Bryozoan and T. Bryo research. Environmental change is likely to cause PKD outbreaks in more northerly regions as warmer temperatures promote disease development, enhance Bryozoan biomass, and increase spore production. Basically, the world is changing because of climate change. And in many ways, the water is warming. We need to find ways to address issues like this that are a result of climate change before it's too late. Obviously, T. Bryo is poorly understood. More research is needed to effectively address it, but the possibility of outbreaks related to climate change is growing every year. Are there any questions? <laughs>